Dr. Moore, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and one of the key long-term folks who's been an EP consultant for the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center. Come on up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Child and conference organizers for having me here. I've been asked to talk about the future of device therapy in adult congenital heart disease, specifically uh, some of the newer uh, products that are in development and already, uh, already available. And so I'm gonna talk about those and, and how they apply to our patients specifically. I have no disclosures. Okay, so the, the problem we have is the existing, the, the technology that we're using currently is based on concepts that are now over 50 years old. Um, the first implantable pacemaker was described in 1960 in a surgical journal. And this is a picture from that first publication in Man. Uh, and down here on the, on the right, you can see the, uh, the way this device looked. It had, a, it had a bipolar lead and it had a pulse generator. And that's, that's essentially exactly what we're still using today. In fact, this looks very similar to some devices I just put in like a week ago. Um, except now they put their logo on the front of the, the can. Um, so, you know, we haven't changed the way we do things in, in over half a century. And so I think this is the reason that we need to start looking for new, uh, new technologies that overcome some of the limitations that are inherent in this kind of concept. So I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, essentially three, cate three categories of, of devices. There's the leadless cardiac pacemakers. Uh, there's a single chamber device that's already available. Um, there is a uh, dual chamber device uh, that's not yet available, has not been tested uh, in uh, humans. In fact, there's some animal models uh, being developed, but this is really far off, and so I'm not gonna really talk about the dual chamber leadless cardiac pacemaker today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the wireless LV electrode for resynchronization therapy, that's a, a really exciting one. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the subcutaneous ICD. That, that, that last one's been out the longest, and we had the most experience with that one. So the first category, leave this cardiac pacemakers. Um, the, the rationale for this is that uh, the basic design concept, which includes a lead, that's the weakest link in generally for pacemakers and defibrillators, leads just eventually can fail. And the reason they do this is because they're, they're materials, and when subjected to ongoing stress, uh, these things uh, can eventually fracture and develop insulation issues. If you think about the minute, how many times the heart beats per minute, you have 60 beats per minute, that translates to 100,000 beats a day, and over the course of a lead lifetime, that's hundreds of millions of beats. So you have progressive stress on these things and they eventually will fail. The other major issue is infection. So um, uh, when you have, a, especially when you put in a transvenous device, you have a, a portal of entry into the vascular space. And when you put in the first system, there's a small chance for infection. And then every time you change out the generator, which you know we have a lot of young patients uh, that we care for, uh, multiple generator changes over the course of their lifetime. There's, each one of those gives them a chance of getting an infection. This can then, then lead to endocarditis. The whole system has to come out. You have to do an extraction, which carries a, a, a risk for morbidity and even mortality. Um, less common risks or problems we see are erosion, cardiac perforation, and thrombosis. So these are all reasons to get away from the traditional uh, uh, d uh, concept that we've been using. In our congenital population, there's additional benefits, and those include things where you don't have access to the, the heart easily for leads, uh, which include, say, mustard patients who are prone to SVC baffle obstruction or complete occlusion in some cases, AV valve disease, you, know, you have severe Epstein's, or you have a bioprosthetic tricuspid valve, uh, lots, lots of situations where putting the lead across those valves can uh, cause uh, more rapid uh, deterioration of function. And finally, we have a lot of patients who have intracardiac shunts. And we know that uh, putting a lead into a heart uh, when you have a shunt, even if it's predominantly left to right, can still lead to systemic thrombosis and stroke. And Eisenmenger would be a, sort of the ultimate example of that. So uh, this is what's out there now, or coming in what's out there now. Medtronic has a, a device called the Micra. Uh, which uh, just was FDA approved in April of last year, um, and it's the only FDA approved device so far. Uh, St. Jude, though, has its own um, nano stem device that's uh, it's actually developed first, but it's had some issues recently with the battery chemistry. They're redoing some of the things with that. Uh, and then the Boston Scientific has the Empower device, which is uh, in certainly the most infancy, uh, the beginning stages of its development still. So I'll focus on the Medtronic Micros. That's the one that's actually out there and we're being implanted currently. This is the comparison of the device with, uh, this is the smallest Medtronic pulse generator, the Adapta S. Uh, 
and this is the micro. So it's a, actually a tenth the size of the current smallest device. And uh, not only that, it contains the uh, pacing function, the electrodes are built into this device, whereas you need a lead with this other one. So very compact, very versatile uh, device. This is some of the uh, differences in the characteristics between the, the conventional pacemaker here and the Medtronic Micra. Um, it's uh, less than a cc in volume, whereas the conventional device is around 10 cc's. And then the other major differences, there's a lot, but the other major differences um, are the way that it measures thresholds. It actually paces just above the output, uh, the threshold, so it preserves the battery. These devices are estimated, uh, uh, are expected to last over 10 years. Also a unique rate response algorithm. It has a triaxial accelerometer. Uh, the, the issue is if you have something implanted in the heart, it'll sense the heart motion and potentially pace the patient faster. So there's a unique uh, rate response algorithm so it doesn't do that and really senses real motion. And it has a, a, a different end of service behavior. These devices, when they're implanted, are meant to stay in place. They quickly endothelialize and are not easily extracted at that point. So when the battery eventually needs, uh, is, runs out, then the, the idea is to put in another device alongside the first one. And you don't want crosstalk between the two. So the first device can be turned off, uh, unlike traditional pacemakers, and it also will automatically turn off at the end of service. Um, this is the implant, uh, sort of this is the schematic of the implant technique goes. It's a 24 French delivery system from the femoral venous approach. The uh, device has uh, four nitinol tines at the tip, and then when it's deployed, those engage the myocardium. You need three out of four to be engaged in order for it to be secure. And uh, it's been shown to be extremely durable in terms of stability and low risk for thromboembolism. So that's really good for our patient population. So I'll move on now to the uh, resynchronization device that's coming. This is a wireless LV in, uh, electrode. It's made by a company in Cal Sunnyvale, California called EMB, uh, EBR Systems. Uh, the problem with uh, conventional CRT, transvenous CRT is, uh, well, there's multiple. Uh, so, you know, in general, um, there are two or three venous branches that we can pick from, uh, but depending on the patient's underlying anatomy, they may or may not have a, a branch that goes to the, the perfect spot for resynchronization. We also know that leads uh, can be uh, less, are, we know that lead, uh, CS leads are less stable than active fixation leads uh, due to variations in the anatomy, caliber of the vessel, and things like that. Um, there's more, we more often see problems with acceptable thresholds when pacing from the epicardium versus the endocardium. And finally, even if all of those things go well, you get a, you get a good spot, you put it in secure, you may have phrenic nerve capture at that site, and then you have to, take, you have to move the lead somewhere else. So because of that, we see a fair, fairly large um, percentage of patients who are non-responders to traditional CRT. It's about 30% in most large studies. There's a variety of uh, solutions to this that have been proposed, such as quadrupolar pacing leads, where you can sort of change the vector where you're pacing to try to avoid some of those issues. There's active fixation leads, which are sort of falling out of favor because, you know, if the device becomes infected, you can't get them out. Um, you can always go to the surgical epicardial access, but, you know, it's more invasive, obviously. And then um, endocardial leads, have actually even transvenous endocardial leads have been implanted in patients when, there's, when all else fails. I think the, the uh, unique niche in our patient population is going to be the systemic RVs, mustards and settings, where you don't have a coronary sinus branch that can be even, you know, is even accessible to the venous system uh, because of the surgical baffle in most cases. And CCTGA, where the, the, the congenital anomalies of the coronary sinus uh, make placement of CRT, transvenous CRT extremely difficult. These can be very long procedures. We can actually do it in a lot of cases, but um, in some cases, it's just impossible with the, with the underlying anatomy. Um, and the last thing is we know endocardial pacing actually is superior to epicardial pacing for resynchronization. Uh, the natural exit site of the uh, Hisperkinji system is the endocardial surface. The, the wall is naturally uh, activates endocardial to epicardial. And so epicardial pacing is just uh, inferior to endocardial pacing. So that's the other motivation for this. As I mentioned, people have tried to put in endocardial leads with typical transvenous systems um, by doing a transeptal puncture from above. And in this, when, you know, when traditional conventional CRT fails, so here they're putting a CS, uh, or rather they're putting an endocardial lead in the LV. This actually works, patients get better, but uh, long-term follow-up of these patients has shown an unaccept very unacceptable, obviously, you'd expect uh, risk for systemic thromboembolism. And um, that's despite oral anticoagulation. So we need something different. This is the, the device I mentioned before. It's a uh, tiny uh, electrode. It's um, three millimeters in diameter by nine millimeters in length. It has a barbed tine at the end here. 
and it's covered with a woven polyester coat that is um, that quickly endothelializes when it's implanted and should pose almost no thromboembolic risk. The uh, electrode itself does not have any battery components. So way, the way this works is there's an, a transmitter that gives off an ultrasound beam that's placed subcutaneously, and then the, uh, the electrode translates that in energy into a pacing stimulus, and then there's a battery pack that sits uh, in the chest. So. This is what it looks like when it's implanted. You have the electrode here. You have the uh, transmitter and the intercostal space giving off this ultrasonic beam. Uh, and then the battery pack here. It's meant to be co-implanted with a, another transvenous device because the way it works, at least now, is it senses the RV impulse and then paces the LV simultaneously. Um, this is just showing how it's deployed. Basically, you just stab it into the LV endocardium and, uh, <laughs> and release the device. It's not very... Uh, Elegant, that's a good word, thanks. Um, and there are a few studies in Europe. Uh, the, the, uh, this device has shown that it's actually been effective, especially for patients who have failed a, a conventional CRT, and they respond. So we know this device works. Uh, there's a follow-up study, a much larger study recently that's not yet been, only an abstract form published so far. Uh, uh, high, uh, high rate of successful implant and good six-month follow-up data. Um, so this device is coming. It's got a US IDE so far and we'll be seeing this device pretty soon. And again, I think it's going to be most useful for our uh, systemic RV patients, probably. Um, finally, the subcutaneous ICD. This is the one we have the most experience with so far. And the rationale for this one is very similar to uh, the leadless cardiac pacemaker, which is the big two, again, lead failure, even more likely with defibrillation leads because they have so many components, uh, and infection. But in our adult congenital, uh, adult congenital population, we have, again, similar indications, I think, we're going to find for this device. And the additional one, though, is a complete absence of transvenous access does not preclude this uh, placement of this device. It's entirely subcutaneous, as opposed to, as opposed to leadless cardiac pacemakers. Um, so it was approved by, uh, by the FDA in 2012. Uh, this small startup company was, was quickly bought out by Boston Scientific at that point. And uh, this is, shows how it's placed. There is a, uh, the, the device sits in the axilla, and then there's a lead that's tunneled over to the sternum, and there's the defibrillation coil here. It actually works by sensing what's very similar to a surface ECG. Um, there's electrodes on the coil and in the can, and you can get things like AVF, lead one or lead two, depending on where those vectors are going. And it's able to discriminate SVT and VT really reliably. The shock is given from the coil to the can, it uh, gives an 80 joule shock as opposed to a 40 joule max for most transvenous devices. And that's part of the reason it's, it's bigger. It's a 60 cc device. Um, this is the implant technique. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward. It takes about an hour to do this and with minimal fluoroscopy. Uh, the device is placed in the axilla with a five centimeter incision. This, there's a tunneling tool to get the lead over to the sub xiphoid area and then up along the sternum. It's all sutured in place and it's, uh, it's, really to, it's relatively a straightforward procedure. We did a study on this. Uh, there's actually now data on adult congenital patients with this particular device. It's been out a little bit longer. We, we actually did a multi-center study with the ARC network that uh, Dr. Lurie mentioned. And uh, we wanted to see what kind of patients would benefit most from this device in our congenital population and how did the device perform uh, acutely and over the follow-up period. We found that the, the bottom line is we found that the patients most likely to benefit are the single ventricle physiology patients. And so most of those, the most common diagnosis was single ventricle physiology, um, most often uh, palliated by Fontan operation. And the device did very well. It acutely at implant was able to convert to sinus uh, VTVF to sinus rhythm with 100% efficacy. And in follow-up, we had one patient that received appropriate shocks. And um, the one, one of the caveats here that we did have, a, we had four patients out of 20, so about 20% 20 uh, uh, had inappropriate shocks, which is a little bit high, uh, although most of the inappropriate shocks could have been avoided with um, reprogramming. And we learned a lot, actually, from the study about how to reprogram these devices for our patients. The one big uh, disadvantage of this device is it can't pace. Um, and so I think that's going to be, um, leads us into the next topic, which is this leadless pacemaker subcutaneous ICD combination. We found in our multi-center study, we had one patient who had uh, basically an asystolic arrest with this device, and we've had in our own experience now another additional patient who've had, who's had uh, severe bradycardia asystole with this device. And so I think that's one of the major limitations. Um, as I'll uh, show here, this is an example of a VT that was success successfully shocked. 
uh, to a junctional rhythm here with some, with some PVCs, but then the patient had this asystolic period afterwards. Fortunately, this patient did well in the long run, but it really points to the limitation of the SICD. We do have uh, a new um, uh, uh, addition coming. Uh, Boston Scientific is working on a leadless cardiac pacemaker, as I mentioned earlier, that will, can be uh, deployed and will sit uh, we'll be able to communicate with the SICD to provide bradycardia pacing and antitachycardia pacing, but this is still in development. But this will be a real game changer for the SICD in our population. So with that, the take-home points, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate that the conventional technology we've been using has, has inherent limitations that are basically impossible to overcome. We have a lot of novel technologies um, that are either in development or already out there, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the future holds in terms of applications to our congenital population. We're starting to see some of those already, but I think we're going to learn a lot more in the next few years. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. All right.